This simulation allows us to manipulate the positions of protons and electrons in a two-dimensional grid and see what types of electric field and electric potential patterns result. As you can see at the top right, the grid size is measured in picometers. Each small box is 100 picometers on a side. And so 10 of these small boxes, or five large boxes, is 1,000 picometers. A picometer is one trillionth of a meter, or one times 10 to the minus 12 meters. And so 1,000 picometers, or five large boxes, is around one nanometer, one times 10 to the minus nine meters. We chose this size scale because ordinary atoms are typically one nanometer or smaller in diameter. We can place and move around up to three positive and three negative charges in any configuration we'd like. Or we can choose some of the predefined configurations. You can see the hydrogen atom consisting of a single proton and electron, the helium atom consisting of two protons and a nucleus surrounded by two electrons, and hydrogen gas consisting of two hydrogen atoms bound together. Going back to the custom configuration, let's arrange a few electrons and protons however we'd like. Let's start by drawing in some electric field vectors. The electric field is a so-called vector field. What is a vector field? It means that at every point in space, everywhere on this grid, there is a vector at that point describing the strength of the electric field. This vector has a magnitude. You might think of that as a length, but really measured in electric field strength and not meters, and a direction. The vector can be represented by an arrow. If we click around the screen, we can unveil the electric field vector at every point in space. Not all of them, because that would fill the screen. In reality, these vectors already exist at these points. They are, in fact, everywhere. We are just showing them. The vectors only really exist at the point from which they emerge. They don't actually take up physical space corresponding to the arrow we've drawn. They are only defined at their base. Notice that the electric field vectors point toward negative charges and away from positive charges. Not only that, these vectors behave according to the principle of superposition meaning that the vector at any point is made up from all the individual electric field contributions from each of the charges. For instance, if one charge makes a rightward field at some point in space, and another charge makes a leftward field there, the field there might combine to zero. The magnitude of the electric field contribution at some point in space, due to a nearby charged object, is calculated using Coulomb's law, K Q over R squared. Here K is a constant describing the strength of the electric interaction. Q is the charge of the object in question that's producing the field, and R is the distance to the point in question where we are measuring the field. Well, what does an electric field vector do for you? It tells you the direction and magnitude of the electric force that would act on a positive point charge if it were placed at that position. So, in essence, it explains to us how electric repulsion and attraction work at a detailed level. We all probably knew, even before taking physics, that opposite charges attract and like charges repel. What Coulomb's law and the vector physics underlying it tell us is so much more in-depth. It tells us how much they attract and how much they repel, and in which direction. In fact, if we turn on the show value slider, we see a little measuring device appear. This device tells us the strength of the electric field at any point in space measured in volts per meter. Since we are very deep at an atomic level, these values are very large, measured in billions of volts per meter. You might also notice that the potential at that point is shown. What's that about? Well, of course, forces aren't the whole story in physics. We can also learn about the basic phenomenon of electric attraction and repulsion through an analysis of the energy of a system. As you'd expect, if you go to work putting two positive charges near each other and they repel each other the whole time, you end up storing substantial potential energy. If you release them, they fly off 
and this electric potential energy turns into kinetic energy. Let's draw some electric potential lines or equipotential lines. These show us where we could add another positive charge to generate a high potential energy, shown in yellow, or a lower potential energy, shown in blue. Higher potentials are near the positive charges. Lower potentials are near the negative charges. Notice that these equipotential lines are very different from electric field vectors. They have no direction. They are just scalar values at different points in space. We can measure the potential along one of these lines using our measuring device. As you can see, the value of the potential doesn't change along a line. The potential is equal everywhere along the line, which is why we call them equipotentials. The potentials are measured in volts, not billions of volts or a billionth of a volt. Why is that? This at least makes sense to me because I think of the chemical reactions involved in creating the 1.5 volts of potential in a small battery are atomic and electric in nature. So the scale seems right to me. A funny thing happens if we overlay both the electric field vectors and the electric potential lines at the same time. Wherever they are near each other, they are perpendicular. The electric field vectors always point perpendicular to the nearby electric potential line or equipotential line. Why is that? Well, think of it this way. If the equipotential lines are like the contour lines on a map of a mountain, then the electric field vectors are like the rivers pointing downhill. They point in the direction the altitude or potential is changing most quickly, most steeply. Of course, we're not talking altitude for real. We're just using an analogy of altitude to discuss electric potential. If you're interested in more about this phenomenon, check out the simulation called lightning rod. Also notice that where the electric potential lines are closest together, the electric field is highest. Again, this speaks to how steep the potential is changing in that region. Where the electric potential lines are farther apart, the electric field is weaker. So we hope you can use this sandbox to play around with these relationships in more depth. Thank you for watching.